Exciting news from the Cool Worlds lab. Today we are announcing a new exoplanet discovery, HD 183579b. All new planet discoveries are incredibly exciting, but this one is particularly special. Join us today as I explain how we found this planet using a new strategy and why this one is particularly interesting. Welcome to Cool Worlds. Literally very cool today. This is a place for sharing a cosmic perspective about our place in the universe and real research emerging from my team, the Cool Worlds Lab at Columbia University. Some of our primary interests are looking for new planets, new moons in the universe, and trying ultimately to find signs of life out there in the cosmos. These are topics which I have personally wondered about since childhood. For many of us, the drive to detect new worlds is instinctual. Humans have an irrepressible urge to explore, to see past the next horizon, to glean the next frontier. But for others, they see a deeper context in this quest. Professor Sarah Seeger, a colleague of mine at MIT, once told me that she thinks of this search much like the cartographers during the Renaissance and Enlightenment eras. Perhaps our role in history will be remembered as those who drew the maps that our descendants will one day take for granted as they explore the stars, filling in the regions of here be dragons with new continents, landscapes and panoramas, enough to satiate appetites both subtle and gross. To date, we know of more than 4,000 exoplanets, mostly discovered by a single telescope, NASA's historic Kepler mission. But one downside of Kepler was that it stared at the same stars during its primary mission, and so in order to observe a large sample, it had to look very deep into space, the stars that are often thousands of light years away. And so these are hardly places that even likely our distant descendants will be able to visit. But more pertinently, in the near term, these are stars which are so dim that even the mighty Hubble and upcoming James Webb Space Telescope are simply unable to glean much about their properties, such as their atmospheres, their surfaces, and even the potential for satellite systems. And that's why TESS has been so exciting over the last few years. TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, follows on from Kepler, but Instead, it looks at the entire sky for over a two-year period. It does this by shifting which stars it looks at roughly every month, tiling the sky piece by piece. Because of this, it of course has far more stars in its field of view than Kepler. And so, whereas Kepler might have only had a handful of nearby bright stars in its fixed scopes, TESS can accumulate thousands of the things. And so, like many exoplanet teams across the world, here in the Cool Worlds Lab, we have been very interested in using the TESS mission to detect new planets, as indeed we already have done so. But, you know, some of you might know this from watching these videos. To me, I'm not so interested in doing the kind of run-of-the-mill type research. For me, the real interest is chasing down new methods, new approaches to advancing our knowledge. And don't get me wrong, the industrial work of detecting thousands of planets is crucial, but to me, it has a certain monotony too. What excites me personally is finding new paths that might help these efforts improve in the future. So last summer I got chatting with a new student working with me, that was Skylar Palatnik, an undergraduate from University of Pennsylvania, and I pitched to him an idea, a strategy that might in fact do just this. Now before I invite Skylar on here and he can explain how this method works, let me just give you a quick background about one of the most conventional and popular ways of confirming planets today. When Tess stares at these stars, it sometimes sees repeating dips in brightness, which could be caused by planets periodically eclipsing as they go round. The problem is that this could also be simply a mirage, perhaps caused by two stars eclipsing each other instead, for example. So to rule that out, a slam dunk approach is simply to weigh how heavy is that object which is going around the star. Because stars, of course, weigh a lot more than planets. So if you can weigh this object, you should be able to distinguish just off that fact whether this is a planet or another star. Usually, we do this by watching the star's light carefully to see if it blue and red shifts back and forth, indicative of gravitational perturbations revealing the orbiting mass. That's a method that's known as radial velocity, or simply RV for short. But TESS simply can't measure that. It wasn't designed to. So instead, 
one usually has to apply to a large telescope here on the Earth and use up some of their precious observing nights to look at your star. That's generally expensive and very competitive to get the time that you need. So for a long time, many of us have been interested in trying to find ways that we can confirm these planets, or at least some of them, without having to take any new data at all. In other words, can we just sit at our computer desk, look through the archives of all of the available data and somehow prove that these signals are indeed real planets? So let me bring Skylar in here to explain how this works. Hey Skylar, thanks for coming on man, how are you doing? Great, super excited to be here. Thanks for joining us. So you know what, I've discovered a fair few planets in my day, but I have to say, the more you do it, you sometimes get a little bit jaded. You almost forget what it's like, that first thrill of discovery. So maybe you can tell everybody out there, how does it feel to discover a new planet? Yeah, it's honestly incredible. I can't even describe the feeling. It's like there were so many points during this project where we were looking and we thought we had found something only to find we were mistaken. It's just like amazing to be at the point where we can confidently say like, this is definitely a planet. And also to have been like a primary part of getting to that point is just, it's really, it's super rewarding. Well, you did a lot of hard work to get here, Skylar, so thank you. Now, you know, one thing that might be confusing is that normally the way we detect planets is, you know, tests would see them and then we would ask a telescope for new telescope time to try and confirm this object, maybe weigh how heavy that object really is to confirm it's a planet. But we didn't take any new data here. So can you walk the audience through how is it that we got around doing that? How do we confirm these planets? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so one of the cool aspects of the TESS mission is that TESS is looking at a lot of well-known stars that are, are nearby and bright. And this means that there's a lot of TESS targets that have been observed uh, and their radial velocities have been measured uh, a lot of times by, by various different surveys. And some of them even span decades and years. So uh, that means that there's so much archival RV data sitting around, it wasn't entirely necessary to go and say, we need more telescope time. So we figured kind of instead of just throwing our hand in the competitive pool of uh, telescope uh, observing time applications, we, we figured we could just look through the archives and see what might be out there, uh, which could match up with the existing test data. And that's a good question. So where do we get this? You know, you say dig into the archives and someone wondering from home might be wondering, what, what does that really mean? What are these archives? So where does the data that you use to confirm this planet come from? Yeah, so uh, there's, there's a bunch of different radio velocity or RV archives. Uh, the ones that we used were the, the HARPS mission and then the LCES or high res mission, uh, which are basically, they're two different missions that took radio velocities of thousands of different stars, um, looking at slightly different uh, locations in the sky. And so these, these are just sitting there public for anyone to, to take basically. And I think uh, Harps had like 200,000 RVs for almost 3000 stars. I think they spanned almost 20 years. And then high res had, about 60,000 public RVs for 1,600 stars, also spanning like 20 years. So this data is just sitting out there for anyone to look at. And if you match it up with the, the data that we can get from tests, then you can potentially, and in our case, definitely find something cool. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've a lot to thank these observers over the last 20 years for, for collecting all this data for us. So essentially, you're cross-referencing these stars which have been observed by tests that seem to have planets with this gigantic archive of radial velocities. How many matches were there, though, when you went through that? There was 18 objects that had RVs in either or both archives and were tests transiting objects of interest. Mm -hmm. um, there were several more that were test transiting objects of interest and had RVs that just didn't fit our criteria because they were either already validated planets, so we weren't worrying about them because our goal was to validate new planets, or uh, planetary candidates with very few RV points, so we couldn't do any tests on them because they didn't have enough data. Um, so 18 total that, that fit our criteria and were both RV and test objects. So once you found these matches between the archival radio velocities and the test planetary candidates, which were 18, 
What did you do once you have those 18? How, how do you proceed from that point? Obviously, we wanted to check if any of these 18 were real planets. So to do that, we have to check whether the RVs are both coherent and in phase with the, the transit signals from TESS. And because no one has, has really done this exactly the way we have, uh, we had to think a little bit out of the box to come up with a, an objective way to quantify how probable a good matchup is between the transits and RVs for, for a given planetary candidate. The way that we did this was we fit a curve to the RV data using random guesses for the period, and we knew these random guesses were wrong. And then we compared it to a curve we fit to the RV data using the true period of the planetary candidate reported by test. And uh, by doing this, we can kind of count up how often the, the tests or the true period works better than these random guesses that we know are wrong. And we can use that to, to define a false alarm probability, which you can think of as being the probability that we're wrong about the planetary candidate being a planet. We didn't get 18 planets, of course, of this. We only found, spoiler alert, one of these objects that really met our criteria to 99% confidence of being a real planet. Tell us about this new planet. What are its properties like? What is its orbit like? What's it like to see the sunset when you're flying through the clouds of this thing? <laughs> I'd say there's three main takeaways for this planet that, uh, that are most important to just think about. Uh, the first one is its physical characteristics. The second one is the host star's physical characteristics. And the third is its potential for future observability. Uh, for the first key takeaway, uh, the planet is a 20 Earth mass, three and a half Earth radius planet uh, with an equilibrium temperature of about 770 Kelvin. And that places it uh, firmly in the warm Neptune category of planets. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, I mean it's similar to Neptune's size. And because of its dimensions, it's likely to be gaseous in composition. Additionally, it's orbit uh, around its host star is about one third the distance of Mercury's orbit from the sun. For the second takeaway about the host star's characteristics, uh, this is what's really cool. Uh, the host star is remarkably sun-like. It's uh, about 1.03 uh, solar masses and 0.99 solar radii. So this is really cool because we have a warm Neptune orbiting a sun-like star, which is, there's no warm Neptunes in our solar system. So that makes it exciting. And finally, for number three, uh, the observability. The great news is that HD 183579 is a really bright star. And that means that future missions can definitely take, uh, take good measurements of this planet. It's actually in the top 1% brightest uh, test stars known to have any planetary candidates. And that's really, it's awesome for future prospects of taking spectroscopic measurements or any, any sort of measurements you may want to take uh, for this system. Yeah, this is a great system. I'm really excited about this. And you know what, working with you, Skylar, over this last six months has reminded me about why exoplanet discovery is so exciting. So I thank you for that as well. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what else comes of your career, Skylar. I'm sure this is just the first of many discoveries for you. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, no problem. I hope so. Uh, it's definitely been been amazing to work with you and kind of get like a look into the eyes of like somebody who's way up in in science and it's it's been awesome thanks my pleasure man bye now as we heard hd183579 b is no ordinary exoplanet there are two really special things here for me first is the fact that the star is just so similar to that of the sun when we look at different exoplanetary systems we often find wild and diverse properties but we could always justify that the reason those systems look so different is simply because they started differently, different initial conditions. Make the star a little heavier, for example, and the entire story of planet formation could play out differently, like traveling back in time and just changing one thing. The butterfly effect would lead to radically different outcomes. But for HD 183579b, there's almost no discernible difference between its star and our sun. It has the same mass, the same radius, the same temperature. It lives in the same part of the galaxy and is a single star, just like us. So one can't help but wonder, how did it end up so different? 
And so when we look at this planet that has the same mass and radius as that of Neptune, it's reasonable to postulate that it presumably formed in the outskirts of its solar system, just like Neptune did. I mean, that's where all the ice is and gas are to form these ice giants after all. But something happened, something weird happened in this system to cause this planet to shrink its orbit by a factor of something like 300 to end up in its current position. And it's remarkable to wonder what that could be given the star is so similar to that of the sun. What tiny difference between our sun and this star triggered this enormous difference in the outcome? The second reason this planet is so special is because we actually have a shot at figuring out the answer. Because the planet is so bright, we can obtain potentially amazing data for it. In fact, we calculated that using the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope, it should be possible to watch the transit in different colors and thus determine the chemical composition of its atmosphere. So if indeed this planet was born in the outskirts of its solar system and migrated all the way into its current position, it should have actually scooped up a lot of debris, dust and metals during that migration. And we could detect that in its atmosphere. And so here's an opportunity to essentially prove that migration occurred and even constrain how fast it happened. And regular subscribers of the channel know that I love my exomoons and here too, this planet offers a unique opportunity. Let's suppose that this planet did indeed start its life where Neptune lives today, and it even had a moon that is similar to Neptune's largest moon, that's Triton. Now, even during this huge migration process, as long as that migration is fairly smooth, we calculate that this planet HD 183579b would still be holding on to its Triton. And yet more, what makes this really exciting is that because this host star is so bright, the James Webb Space Telescope would be able to detect it. There's very, very few planets that have those two properties, so this is an outstanding exomoon target for the James Webb. So we have submitted our proposal for telescope time just a couple of months ago now and are keeping all of our fingers and toes crossed that NASA agree with us and will give us a chance to observe this gem of a planet. I want to say one last thing, this project, this planet discovery was directly funded by some of you, the Cool World's donors. If you helped us out, then I think you have a legitimate claim to say that you helped discover a new planet. So thank you so much and congratulations on helping to find a planet. Look, if you feel like you're missing out on this process and want access to all of the extra bonuses and stuff that we give out to our donors, then please do consider helping us out. I mean, you're not only supporting a YouTube channel, you are supporting a real research team that are working on the cutting edge of astronomical discovery. So thank you so much for watching everybody. If you have any comments or questions about this plant discovery, please do put them down below. Or maybe you actually have a suggested nickname. We need a good name to call this thing when we talk about this planet. HD 183579B doesn't really roll off the tongue. So thanks again for watching and until the next video, stay thoughtful, stay curious. Just wanted to quickly say that this episode we want to thank Vaseline Alexandrov, our latest Cool World Stoner. So thank you so much for your support and until next time, see you around the cosmos.